Thank you for staying with us. Let's talk economy now. The Modi government has got another jolt this time from the International Monetary Fund or the IMF as it's known as. Now the IMF held a massive news briefing yesterday where they spoke about how they see the world's economy going in the coming months for the next one year. They also cut their forecast for growth for the current year and gave out the reasons for that. Now I'm just going to take you through some of the basic pointers and uh, a lot of this briefing was held by the uh, IMF member Geeta Gopinath and IMF has actually cut global gro growth forecasts. They've also slashed India's growth outlook. So India in fact is weighing on global growth is the big headline that came out of it. According to the International Monetary Fund, because India is slowing down, that's also dragging down the growth of the rest of the world. Now keep in mind that we were at one point of time one of the fastest growing economies and not so long ago. A year ago, during this time, in January itself, we were clocking a growth of 8%. The last data that came out pegged us at 4.5%. That's been our downfall. Basis of that, they have now recalculated everybody's growth outlook. Before I take you through further details and take you through the crumbling uh, economy crumbling indicators that we have collated, let's listen in to Geeta Gopinath. There are now tentative signs that global growth may be stabilizing. The slight downward revision of 0.1% for both 2019 and 2020 and of 0.2% for 2021 is owed largely to downward revisions for India. For emerging and developing economies, we forecast a pickup in growth from 3.7% in 2019 to 4.4% in 2020 and 4.6% in 2021. Now we have downward revisions of 0.2% for all of the three years. The biggest contributor to the revision is India where growth slowed sharply owing to stress in the non-bank financial sector and weak rural income growth. China's growth, on the other hand, has been revised upward by 0.2% to 6% for 2020, reflecting the trade deal with the United States. In simpler words, it's not looking good for the entire world and it's definitely not looking good for our country. Now here are some more indicators, not just the IMF Bank that's talking about it. The World Bank cut our growth forecast from 6.5% to 5%. Ministry of Statistics of our own government has actually gone on to say that the economy will grow at a slower pace of 5%. The State Bank of India's research team has come out and projected a growth of 4.6% growth rate for India. If you go beyond just these numbers which are estimates by various organizations and institutions and experts, take a look at the kind of sales we are looking at. Car sales continue to be in the dumps, fell by 8.4% in December. If you look at retail inflation, that's now becoming a huge problem. Food inflation and retail inflation jumped to 7.35% in the month of November. Food inflation went up to 14% for the month of November. That's the rate of increase of your fruit prices. Rate of increase. And a survey that was recently done, a daily business standard says that CEOs are actually now more negative and pessimistic about the current year. So what's going on? Are we literally pulling down the growth of the entire world and how do we get out of it? Can budget be an, an opportunity that can be used? Let's say good evening to Sir Zafar Islam, National Spokesperson for the BJP, Professor R. Nagaraj with the IGIDR, Santosh Meratra, Professor of Economics at the Center for Informal Sector and Labor Studies, JNU, and Professor Amon Agarwal, Director for Indian Institute of Finance. Now, if I can just go across uh, to uh, Santosh Mehrotra and ask him to, you know, uh, give his views on what we are looking at, the situation it, that is Professor Mehrotra. We, we were just talking about being one of the fastest growing economies in the world a year ago. And now it seems that we are bringing everybody's growth rate down. It's true that we were the second fastest growing large economy of the world for nearly 15 years and then 
For the last several years, since China's growth rate dipped, we became the fastest growing large economy in the world. But now with the recent declines in the growth rates, we are now 40th in the league table, 4-0, 40th in the league table. So, you know, clearly the writing is on the wall and there are many problems which have been accumulating for a while. I think we all know about the twin balance sheet problems uh, that were inherited by this government, meaning the corporate uh, balance sheets were extremely stressed and the bank's balance sheets were extremely stressed. Uh, we managed to sustain growth for about a two-year period, partly on account of the fall in the global oil prices. Um, and then suddenly, when <laughs> the... Uh, the demonetization happened, uh, there was the beginnings of a slowdown, but the decline in the oil prices had sustained growth and also uh, because money flowed into the banks, the banks started lending to the NBFCs, the non-banking financial institutions, which then started lending to the stressed, or, you know, earlier stressed uh, real estate companies We've got now the unraveling of the NBF NBFC starting with the ILFS. And on top of that, of course, we've got an additional problem with the NBFCs lending to the real estate sector collapsing. So you've got a multiplicity of problems on top of the preceding two twin balance sheet problems that this government um, inherited. So, if you, if you ask the question, can the budget do something? It's mm. a bit unlikely, unfortunately, the likelihood, you know, after all, the budget deals with only public expenditure and with taxes. And, it, and then if the gap is too large as it is, as the Controller and Auditor General of India has said, then the government can borrow, but the potential for borrowing is also not very great. So really, structural reforms have to happen. Okay. The budget is not likely to be able to do too much. Okay, structural reforms are needed at this point of time, uh, which may not come through the budget. Uh, let me also get in opening comments from Professor Agarwal before I go across to Mr. Zafar Islam. You see, Tanvi, the, the projections are clear. There is an indication of a slowdown, but still we are growing. Secondly, there are serious steps which need to be taken by the government, given the recent updates which have come both on the inflation front and the growth front. Uh, the government has still not done much on the fiscal uh, deficit spending. They are still stuck on to the fiscal deficit targets, and that is going to be contravailing for their own growth if they stick on to those targets. You know, we they have to relax that. They have to increase the fiscal spending. If they do not do that as of today, it will be a big problem. The other problem is an operational problem, which this government did try to attend to when Nirmala Sita Ramanji first organized the press conference, which was doing the administrative reforms, which are very important. The regulators, unfortunately, each of, whichever sector you look at, the regulators are not actually wanting to be enablers or facilitators. They are becoming so stringent, so hard, that for any industry to exist, any organization to exist today, the regulators are crimping them up. And as a result, investments by various investors and various people in different parts of societies is becoming difficult for them to survive and grow with the kind of structure which is being put forward by various regulators. Now, this is beyond the direct control of the government, but certainly they have to bring in and talk to all the regulators. And when there are difficult times, they need to ease some of these norms which they are creating and stringing fines. So this is something which is critically important, is that they need to do fiscal spending, not stick to this 3.3, 3.4, 3.5. If we have a fiscal space of almost 100 basis points with us, Given okay. the foreign exchange reserves, we have been able to accumulate. So we should not worry. And the previous government, previous to previous year, when this previous government, before they took over 2014, they did use yes. the, the foreign exchange reserves to take care of the economic frameworks in the economy. So we, well, we need well, to look uh, at those factors. Correct. There are a large number of measures which can be done. Correct. Now, I take your point uh, and, you know, and um, simply put, there are more and more people today who are saying that the government needs to spend more. It doesn't matter what your gap, if your gap between your uh, revenues and your expenditure widens 
and your borrowing goes up, but there is no other option of reviving the economy than for the government to spend at a time when private companies are not willing to do so. Now, I've seen it work both ways. The minute the government's fiscal deficit starts going beyond a point, then they're accused of, you know, not having a sound policy. Right now, it's the other way around. Mr. Zafar Islam, this is a tricky one to do, you know, to, whether to spend more or to have better data and figures to show to the world. Well, Tanvi, if you just do a back testing for last six years, six yes. uh, budget which we have presented, every time you just do an analysis, you will see that uh, government spending, uh, the capex, is always has never come off. It has always improved and in increased purely because the government is committed to invest and it has always been percentage to the uh, to the GDP has been maintained by the government for the last six years. Then we have re reduced the revenue expenditure, controlled the revenue ex expenditure, but we did spend a sizable amount uh, for CapEx. Uh, government was investing, spending regularly. There are two f few things which is important. Like we, you are talking about the fiscal deficit. Yes, there is a stated objective of the government that we will maintain a fiscal prudence. And uh, I will not comment uh, uh, what the government is likely to do, whether the government is likely to uh, uh, let go the target what they have or whether they, they will still maintain the fiscal discipline, what they have indicated. But all I can say that the maneuvering, the, there are some, uh, the FRBM does uh, allow government to maneuver and that flexibility is there with the government. Should the government decide to do that, they will definitely, government will take that uh, call and it is the, their discretion. I can't jump the gun at this point in time. But having said that, you also have to understand the government has its own limitation in terms of the balance sheet, if you just see, and the revenue side on how the committed cost is there. More than 43, 44% of 45% uh, is a committed cost where you can't do anything. It's mm. a, a debt servicing of the outstanding uh, uh, government securities. It's a committed administrative cost. Those things that you have to meet with the meet with the revenues, then you are left with only 55 percent where you have to maneuver, and you have it's a large country, a lot of expectation. Everyone has expect expectation, mm. and, and and the government uh, it's a uh, will definitely do something judiciously so that it can address the concern of every single expectation which has in the country. Away from that, let me tell you one one more thing. It, somebody was talking about the structural reform. If you just, again, I'm saying it, just see the kind of a structural reform which has been undertaken by this government is, is something unprecedented. I mean, that is, yes, it will slow down the economy, yes. It mm. has slowed down the economy across the globe when it, such a structural reforms of this magnitude have been undertaken. But it, it's a temporary phenomena. We know that all the right decisions have been taken by the government and it will, it will definitely enable the economy to grow and going forward, all the decision which has been taken will definitely start showing positive impact on the GDP growth. We, while the forecast does suggest uh, that they have such re as what are these decisions that you are hoping? But we are confident that such as just what are these decisions that you are hoping will? We, we are confident. <coughs> go ahead. No, I'm just asking. What are the decisions that you hope go will go deliver go some ahead, positive please. growth? Well, see, the private investment is something which we are very, very, very keen. We know that there is excess capacity in the system. We know the banking, the uh, 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 lending and the liquidity in the banking system was an issue, but that today is there is no liquidity issue. Bank has been recapitalized, and we know that there is a. We are monitoring those those proposal coming to the bank, and if there is a fear of lending, that at least that that is being addressed. And we know that uh, the excess capacity now is more or less over and people, uh, the uh, industries and the private investors will consider new investment purely because there is no, the, uh, at 80% or 75 to 80% capacity has already been utilized. So they will start uh, uh, putting up plant, new plant and those kind of investment we, you will get to see. Away from that, one more thing which I would like to mention that we have, we have focused and that's a very focused and dedicated approach where we want to th see that the, our, our share in the global trade it does improve from 1.7% today to 3%, and that can happen partly because the uh, the global multinationals should set up their shop in India, and for that, whatever need, needed to be done, like for instance, uh, 
bringing the the tax rate down which has come up to 15% mm. all the other measures which has been uh, which had to be taken which has been taken and i'm sure that the, the you will see a lot of companies moving their uh, 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 manufacturing hub in, into India, manufacturing yeah, okay. into, into India, you, and mm. India eventually become manufacturing hub, and those things will will definitely push the growth momentum going forward. Okay, okay. So uh, the corporate tax cuts, for example, that have been done will show results in a few months from now. Is the hope, Professor Nagraj? Let's talk about what changes are further needed. And uh, Santosh Marotra spoke about it and he said there are structural changes, uh, structural reforms that are needed. BJP says, well, we brought in the GST, we've done so many more other things. Uh, what else should we do? Can you give us another example of a change that is needed to restart or kickstart India's growth? Thank you. <clears throat> I think uh, the economy is has slowed down very severely, not just during last 18 months, but for a much longer period, as many of us have been saying. And the problem of the economy is from the demand side and not from the supply side. Uh, the inflation we are seeing right now is only agriculture inflation, and that is only a very short-term problem because of the, uh, the erratic monsoons we have seen in the recent past. I do not see the supply causing inflation as a major issue. The real problem of the economy is from the demand side. And that too, major problem is the demand from uh, in, for investment. See, capital formation, or what we call the investment rate in the economy, has declined from 38% of GDP in 2008 to 29% today. It's almost a 10 percentage point decline over 10 years. Such a decline in investment has never happened in the last 70 years. This is something which is not adequately appreciated by a lot of people in the policy making, so which I, I keep repeating this point. So there's been a severe reduction in rate of capital formation or rate of fixed investment in the economy. And that needs to be corrected. And private corporate sector is in no position to do it because they are mired in, uh, in debt and uh, banks will not lend to them because of NPS, okay? So the way out of it is public investment in a big way. And public investment can happen if we, we, ha if we relax the, the fiscal constraint. In a situation like this of severe demand constraint, what economies should be bothered about is creating jobs and overcoming poverty rather than concern about fiscal orthodoxy. This is something which has mm. gutted Europe between 2010 and 2015. And I'm afraid we, are, we may, may make the same mistake again. So we should, at this moment, be more bothered about creating employment, creating investments, rather than fiscal orthodoxy. <coughs> so we must give up fix, uh, fiscal deficit target for a, for a while uh, and focus on invest, public investment. Public investment can take place in infrastructure mm. and rural regeneration. I will give three examples. One is, of course, the uh, road, uh, the, the highways, and uh, uh, highways, uh, railways, and solar energy. And in rural areas, rural uh, roads are a very important issue. I, uh, just to give you one fact, even after 70 years, more than 20%, that is over a lakh of villages, are not connected by a motorable road. This is a, this is a, uh, a very severe uh, constraint on villages to, uh, to mobility. Okay, so uh, this is one case where you can create, you can create huge demand and you can create large scale employment and overcome poverty because mm. rural road creation simply requires un unskilled labor. Okay, so public investment in various spheres of the economy and rural gener uh, regeneration is the, is the crying need of the day. Okay. Uh, and I think this can be easily done and it can be quickly done provided the government is willing to forego its fiscal orthodoxy. Okay, spend, spend, spend. Government needs to spend. Government needs to keep its fiscal deficit target. 
uh, on the side, it's, you know, borrowing pressure on the side and spend more in a way that, you know, it brings about more jobs, it, it creates more jobs, it gives money to the people, generates employment and gets the growth started. Mr. Zafar Islam wanted to come in. Go ahead, please. Well, Tanvi, I've heard everyone and I have spoken as well. But let me tell you a few statistics which is very, very relevant. First, the people are talking about fiscal deficit and we must revise the target which we have. And then whatever flexibility under FRBM we have, we must flex that uh, fl uh, flexibility and spend more. But there are two disadvantages. The advantage is, yes, you will have more uh, money, at, uh, government will have more money to spend and uh, the government spending will improve. But away from that, one thing which is very important, which I think we, everyone should notice, that the kind of borrowing we have done in the past and the kind of burden we have uh, in terms of debt servicing, that will further uh, uh, go up. And we will, what we will be leaving for our future generation is only the, the uh, government borrowing and huge uh, debt burden on their uh, head so that they keep on servicing. So whatever revenue they, they, they will generate, they will part, most part will go at, uh, in debt servicing. So government is sensitive. I'm not saying whether they will use that uh, what flexibility available under FIBF. Government is sensitive that they cannot uh, go the way the previous government had gone. And today we are actually facing the uh, all the heat purely because the earlier government was uh, uh, not taken the, the kind of decision they should have been taken. In terms of uh, the, the, the fiscal deficit, they didn't control. It was going in the six handle, 6.5, and we have reduced it to 3.5, 3.3% currently. Second thing, which is uh, uh, which I think nobody talks about. All the economists are sitting here. All the experts sitting here, uh, uh, and they are all uh, uh, they monitor economy day in day out. They talk about the supply side. There is no issue. The demand side, there is an issue, and of course, we all understand that the. the the household leverage has gone up. The household saving has uh, come down. The, the capital formation, yes, there is a some. Everything is evident, but they do not what they do not talk about it. They want every penny should the government invest, mm -hmm. but they do not talk about the private se uh, se uh, sector. The sir, sir, the uh, the salary level has gone down so pathetically that the, what is the uh, 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 salary a common man today is earning or what Correct. today is uh, they are earning and what they used to earn in 2004 Correct. so i think that something which they also disposable income in their hand will come when their salary <laughs> will go up, uh, up which is which is something which is very very important for everyone to see Correct. i have done analysis i can give you n number of example how these economists have completely ignored those is important issues they keep on harboring one thing that the government should cut rates cut uh, 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 income tax how long government can cut tax? There's a limitation for the government to cut income tax. Okay. It's because there's a limited limitation in terms of the revenue what you generate. But salaries in 2004, what it used to be, it has come down. Nobody is talking about in terms of CAGR. If you see, it is a negative growth to the extent of 25 to 27 percent. Hmm. And okay, is this okay. the way you and should I, look at I, the economy? Okay, that's a good or point. And I think that a lot of our viewers will also keep connect Keep on with. spending. Have, a, have some sensible discussion. Okay, that's a good point, and I think that's a point a lot of our viewers will also connect with. And you know, uh, the new the new financial year is almost here. It's appraisal season for a lot. I don't think too many people have expectations. They'll probably just be glad they still have jobs. Why is that happening? Is this private sector to be blamed, Mr. Santosh Merotra? Because at the end of the day, they are the ones who are not paying the people, and the people don't have money. That's what Zafar Islam is saying. Now, how do you change that? Is it simply because private sector themselves are not making money? See, wages and salaries rise when there is job growth and there's expectation of further demand increases in the economy. So if salaries are not rising, the main reason is because jobs have not been growing as rapidly as we would like to see. It's not just we would like to see. The Sir, point I'm is the number of entries into the labor data. force has increased, but the number of jobs that are being created Yes, yes, sir. So am I, sir. So am I. Uh, so am I. So I'm not denying that wages, that wages and salaries have not increased. I'm saying exactly what you are saying, sir. So if you could I mean, hear me out, I'll so appreciate apparent, that. I, I was uh, about to come in to, in fact, reinforce what you were saying.
Go ahead, Santosh Merotra. So may I finish what you, I was saying? I was coming to reinforce what you were saying. May I reinforce what you are saying? So, so first of all, yes, he's absolutely uh, Mr. Zafar Imam is absolutely right that wages have not been rising, and particularly they have not risen since 2012, uh, and 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 that's because jobs have not been growing. Secondly, Mr. Imam is absolutely right. One of the reasons why. Uh, growth has been sustained, in other words, growth is happening even, or even though it's happening at a much slower rate, is because of public expenditure. And he's absolutely right. The increases in allocations to PMGSY, to low-cost urban housing, to, to some extent for Manrega, um, and, and, and above all to PM Kisan. So public spending has gone up, and this is one reason why, why uh, growth is, is still sustained. And he's, he, on the structural reforms, yes, of course, this government has been undertaking structural reforms. Uh, no one would dispute that. But the only argument I think I was making was that more structural reforms are needed. And if you give me the time, I can speak about that. And I completely agree with him. I hope that in the budget that we don't have income tax cuts, the government has already done enough of that. Uh, but let me just go back to a point that Mr. Aman Agarwal was making, that, uh, <clears throat> the, and, and in some ways, Professor Nagaraj also made, there are limits to how much uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy can do to improve the state of the economy. The fiscal policy and monetary policy are particularly effective in a situation when the downturn is a cyclical downturn. Then you engage in counter-cyclical fiscal policy, counter-cyclical monetary policy, and you can hope to revive the economy. But we all know, I think there is enough agreement uh, both on this panel as well as elsewhere in, among economists that the problem is structural. In other words, there is, a there is a decline in consumption, and that is because of slow job growth relative to the number of people entering the labor force, as a result of which is wages are not increasing. Mm. Secondly, export growth has been extremely slow. In fact, the apps. Uh, thirdly, as Professor Nagraj rightly pointed out, investment demand is not has, is, is down to a level that prevailed prior to 2004. And so in this situation, in this situation, Mr. Zafar Imam is absolutely right. In, a, in this situation, when the government fiscal situation is very tight, the central government's fiscal situation is very tight, taken with the state government's fiscal situation, it, it, the real deficit, the real f fiscal deficit is likely to be anywhere in the, uh, of the order of 8 to 9% of GDP. In other words, this is what it was just soon after the global economic crisis hit the economy in 2009-10. So you know, the control, CAG has already announced to us that the real fiscal deficit of the central government was 5.68% you know, of GDP. In other words, the space, the fiscal space that the central government at this moment has for increasing expenditure is not that great, which is the reason that I would go back to the point that I was making that, you know, many structural reforms are needed, which go back to, imp for instance, I'll give you some examples. For instance, you know, there has to be another asset quality review of both the public sector banks, as well as more importantly, the NBFCs. Because who took up the slack when the credit, when PSBs, public sector banks, stopped lending? Public sector banks' lending has, been, has not been growing for the obvious reason. But who took up the slack in the last three, three uh, odd years, four years? The NBFCs. But we know that the NBFCs, their financial situation has been exposed. And they, therefore, they required a serious asset quality review by the RBI. If we don't do that, we are not going to see a revival of lending at all. And if there is no revival of lending, we will not get a revival of investment. But Professor it's Malotra, a, if I can come in here. No, the budget can't, can't do very much. Okay, fair Structural. enough. But
But what you are saying is very, very Please, different from what Professor Agarwal was suggesting, because he is saying, and, and you know, in a sense, he was blaming the regulators for being so hard of on. Of course, the, uh, yes, yes. I am. So, so then, so, so. In, in that sense, either we clean up the mess first. I don't which know which regulators he was talking five, about. I am talking years. about the RBI. Yes. Okay. Let's start with the RBI. Because it's the biggest, it's one of You're the biggest right, problems right uh, now. It hasn't banks, gone far enough. Had it gone it, far enough. Yes. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. No, no. I'm saying, of course, an attempt has been made to clean up the, the mess in the public sector banks. But we've got a new set of problems arising from the NBFCs. Please try and understand Correct. what I'm saying. Correct. See, so so what am I? So so I'm saying the following about public sector banks. The the problem with the public sector banks is that, you know, we think that we can continue to do the same thing. In other words, uh, we can recapitalize them, and their their lending pattern and their lending behavior will change. Well, their lending behavior is a bit unlikely to change unless their ownership changes. You know, you have to understand that there is a pg &I committee on banking reform and there is a requirement now for the government to move increasingly towards reducing its shareholding in the PSBs. Perhaps still retain majority holding, that can be debated, but the point is it's it's ownership has to be reduced. Okay. Public sector banks need to compete with each other and compete with the private sector. So, you know, the, so the point is you can't ref, you, you can't go on refinancing Correct. and recapitalizing the public sector banks and, and expect them to change their behavior. Their behavior is unlikely to change. Okay, okay. quick as response long as from the, Professor Agarwal on this. Complete and then ownership to belongs to, to the government. Agarwal. Yes. Aman Agarwal, please. <laughs> Yes, yes, you, yeah, you see, Tanvi, the thing is, it's not only one regulator, almost all regulators, including the RBI, I have been telling it your channel as well. When it comes to NPA's definition, the NPA definition accepted internationally through the BIS is not something which is acceptable in India, and especially not in times when they are difficult, when revenues are not coming, when government organizations are not paying to MSMEs for a long time, their dues are there, a uh, large number of pensioners are not getting money. There are a lot of problems which have been coming in terms of payments coming in, and that's where the organizations which have been functioning for decades now, they've had a working capital issue. At this stage, if there is a default for an organization which has not been being a defaulter in the past, this definition needs to be checked and there needs to be relaxation. When you look at the car industry you talked about, you see the pollution board has come out, the, the new rule of 15 years and 10 years has come out. You're telling a, in the, in, a, a community which buys a car for life, large amount of population of India buys a car for life, mm. one investment for life. And you're telling that the car life is 15. Even in the United States of America, it is not restricted to that level, which is a capitalist economy. You're telling here, so why would someone go about buying a car because the government may come out tomorrow and say this car is also valid for another five years or 10 years? Who would like to buy an investment? Right. Zafar is right that the bank's recapitalization has taken place. But are they flushing money in the, into the system? Is the money going into the system? Is the organizations going in? Why? Because regulators in every industry have become so stringent so exhaustive, there is so much of excessive level of corruption which is there in these organizations that they are, they are actually throttling large number of institutions, whether it is educational institutions, whether it is industry. I know MSME industry I talk with almost every second day. They are facing lots of problems for okay. n number of authorities which okay, are coming okay, to them okay, today. So, uh, it's not only if, the tax if I can, function. It is a lot of other authorities which are there I'm, on a day-to-day -day basis. If I may try and just and, you know, if simplify I talk about education this itself, you a see, little bit. If, if I can just talk of education which I come from. Yes. Tell me just a minute more. Yes. If I just talk of education itself, where mm. I come from, the AICT has shut down a large number of institutions in the last three, four years. Imagine an investor who makes investment of 50 to 100 crores. Mm. He starts a functionality. On small, small grounds, the AICT as a regulator, which is under a situation where the government is wanting to wind it off, is shutting down institutions one after the other. Please understand who would like to invest, who would like to make an investment, come to service a society, and then look at a regulator who actually comes and cripples you off completely <clears throat> on one small ground or the other. 
of the stage that oh a channel of the government website is not being shown on your website or is not being shown to the students so shut it off oh you do not have a small access so shut it off okay. or oh, you do not have certain water or oh, you may give, give them provision give them a year and allow them to function but they said no we would not allow them to function Take, so it is I, I take your point and, and perhaps that's not in one sector yes it and that definitely needs to be looked there. into that's the example from the education sector but if i can come back to the larger point that you and santosh merathra were making in zafar islam banks are under the investigation because of the kind of the way the loans were given off uh, the corruption that went on today we got the news again fresh information about cbi investigating frauds worth 4000 crore rupees across a dozen banks that have happened uh, so on one side if there is this kind of scrutiny and then the banks are not lending further and not giving more loans to companies then uh, then there is going to be a problem it's it's again a very tricky task for the government and for the public sector banks what's your thought on it no tanvi you have to understand as far as the government government is concerned we have no role to play in terms of uh, 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 facilitating loan for any company xyz which used to happen in the past all we have done we have all, only suggested the banks to follow a proper proper credit evaluation process Fair something which bank should be doing unlike in the past a phone a phone call will come from prime minister the then prime minister uh, uh, manmohan singh's office or the then finance minister chidambaram's office or sonia gandhi's office and the loan will be sanctioned without doing any proper evaluation of the credit so credit evaluation process something which we have put in place and something which we think that is the right process right approach may slow down but that is something which we need to focus on secondly the in terms of the collateralization we we have always uh, uh, why all this npa loan has become npa because of the the asset cover which all the banks were taking was always not adequate to cover their debt or the loan what they were saying that sanctioned or lent so those things which we have addressed that is something which method to madness had to be take had to be put in place and which we have done but we have not Uh, involved ourselves in terms of asking a bank no to, no no fair uh, enough and to, that's not uh, what i was uh, insinuating any which was uh, mr account. mr zafar islam i was simply saying what is what is your the, your party's view on this entire conundrum uh, because on one hand the, the allegation that is being made is uh, that the banks are not lending because they fear too many questions will be asked they fear too much of scrutiny they fear what will you know the regulators will ask them next and so they're not giving the loans that's essentially what the debate has been i'm simply asking you what is your view on it no no see the regulators job is to review regulators job is to investigate the regulators job has to, they have to discharge their responsibilities they can't get away with the the responsibility they have been assigned that's their job to ensure the monitoring and the control is something which they have to do it but they cannot become a bottleneck and what mr agarwal was saying as if that the uh, the regulators have become a bottleneck as something if the feedback is correct then i am sure the government will definitely review because our intention is to ensure that there is a ease of doing business and there is no unfair treatment by or in, in, uh, or intruding by any uh, regulators or any uh, government agencies okay we, we are creating a very congenial environment for the companies to grow and if there is any th any suggestion we always welcome those suggestions well i'm sure uh, i'm sure the finance minister has already gone through the, the exercise the of listening to the, the industry the, listening to the banks to the bankers uh, to find out you know what the problem points are and pain points are and and um, everybody is expecting now to see what they get out of the budget announcement but yes uh, i will agree with santosh menotra perhaps a lot of it will have to be outside the budgetary exercise uh you know and not within it the big conversation that happened today and we'll continue all of next week as we also count down to the union budget announcement will be how to revive various parts of indian economy will be about you how the government can improve your life or what is it that the government can do to save your banking account and your savings what is it the government can do to generate more jobs what is it that the government can do to get the consumer spending up and about people don't have money in their hands they're not spending they're keeping whatever they have just in case tomorrow gets worse than today if they don't spend then that's even a bigger problem for the economy there are various aspects you're going to break it all of it down for you the fact of the matter is viewers
the global growth is slowing down. The world is going through a tough phase. But unlike the last global slowdown that we saw, India is in a more tricky situation than we were then. And our growth has been badly hit. We need certain urgent measures from the government. What can they be? That's the conversation we will continue to have. Thank you so much for joining us on this big debate on the economy. Now we move on to the other big focus that we have tonight here on the urban debate. This is the big debate about the role of assembly speakers and whether assembly speakers are often biased in their action because they are from one or the other political party. They themselves are elected legislators and if they should have the power to decide on crucial issues like disqualification of MLAs. Now, why are we talking about this today? We've done that in the past as well, but today is back in the spotlight because of the Manipur disqualification case. Now, there is a plea that was filed in the Supreme Court. And I'll begin by telling you what the Supreme Court said today. The top court said that there needs to be a rethink. The parliament should have a rethink on the powers of speakers when it comes to disqualification of legislators. Supreme Court added that the speaker also belongs to a particular political party. And so perhaps it is needed that we create a more independent mechanism where there is absolutely no question of bias, an independent mechanism to deal with the disqualification controversies that emerge all the time. Now, this is because in Manipur, the speaker has taken his own sweet time, as it has been in many other cases across the country, to take a decision. Now, the Supreme Court has said the Manipur speaker has to take a decision within the next four weeks. What is this decision on? The disqualification of the forest minister, T.S. Sham Kumar. Sham Kumar won the election on a Congress ticket, and then he switched parties and went to the BJP, and then he became a minister. So obviously there is a point about whether he should be disqualified for defecting his party and going to the other party. Now the speaker has been told you, you have to decide in four weeks. That being said, that being the case, the big question I am asking tonight is if there is merit and it's a need of the hour to perhaps take away some of these powers of the speaker and give it to a more independent authority. And to shed some more light on it, I have Abhishek Manu Singhvi, Member of Parliament of the Rajya Sabha, Senior Congress leader, a very respected legal mind joining us this evening, Mr. Singhvi. The basic question, and we've had conversations about this even during the Karnataka controversy, Tamil Nadu, Uttarakhand, Arunachal, so many recent <coughs> examples. And the speaker's role always comes under the spotlight. Uh, it's an extremely important judgment. It's from a judge known for straight talk, speaks ramrod straight, does not uh, indulge in any ambiguity, and it's a much needed judgment. I don't think the case itself is at all important. What is important is the far-reaching principles laid down. See, you need to state some of these things unambiguously and not fudge or go round and round the mulberry bush because these are institutions which have been debased. And I'm not speaking a word of politics. I couldn't care if it was Congress, BJP, non-Congress, non-BJP. That's not the issue at all. Rajiv Gandhi made the 10th schedule with a very noble objective. Defections had become the bane in the 60s and we all know the IRAM, Gayaram stories. Now, either don't make a law about defections. I'm quite happy you don't have a law, have a free for all. If you make a law, what India has achieved is you've made a law and you are making a mockery of the law for at least 20 years. What has come today in the judgment is not novel. It's only great because it has been stated and people have been scared of stating it. I have been speaking about this for decades. Why is it a mockery? A, we don't speak, we don't elect a speaker as, for example, in the old days England used to do, pre-deciding between all parties that a, a speaker will be Mr. or Mrs. X and they will stand from a place unopposed. That's the strength of a speaker. Do you know that? They would make a person stand in an election unopposed and it would be pre-decided that it would be a speaker. Imagine the strength that gives us. Mm. Not done in India. Two, the speaker is made the sole persona designata as they put in law. 
Now, if he is the sole persona designata, even if he is conflicted, he has to decide 10 schedule. Three, it's very simple. If the speaker is of your persuasion, he will not decide in your favor. He will simply decide not to decide for months on end. Till such time as he does not decide on months to end, the person who is allegedly defected and is unconstitutionally there can vote. So he takes advantage of his vote. Number four, if the per uh, speaker is of the opposite persuasion, he'll do the opposite. Number five, a bigger problem in this whole 10th schedule has been not wrong decisions, which have been many, you know, rampant, short, quick, selective, biased, but not deciding. Not deciding is a major decision. It's been a more bigger decision not to decide than to decide. Correct. Because non-decision always helps one side. Correct. So I think without going into technicalities, it's a wonderful judgment and you should either change the 10th schedule completely, which is useless by the way, hmm. unless you start a mechanism for electing an independent speaker. There is no such animal known as an independent speaker unless you follow the old British system of having a speaker elected in advance by all parties unopposed. Otherwise, you should have really the same 10th schedule mechanism by a total independent body. I would not even say just any retired judge, it has to be somebody of a very high authority, uh, you know, who inspires confidence. Okay, so, so let me ask you this, because uh, who could this independent authority be? Should it be a team of people who decides, you know, who appoints them? And is this something, Mr. Singhvi, that the parliament can honestly look at? Because let's be honest, one or the other party always benefits out of such a situation, like you yourself said. Will politicians really be interested in doing away with the system? No, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. It'll... I'll tell you. I'll tell you. First, you have to decide whether defection is an evil. Now, 20 Supreme Court judgments have called it a constitutional sin. Then you have to decide whether you want a law against it. We have a law against it. Then, I don't think it needs much change. The law structure will be the same. The question is, who is the adjudicator under that law? Today, it is the speaker. Well, tomorrow, I would ideally like, and I would like in this country as a general point also, less reliance on judges. We have this mesmeric, hypnotic affection for retired judges for everything. Now, I admire a lot of them as a class. But in the ideal situation, you should also start selecting a few statesmen who are incorruptible, who are above board, and who have that statesman-like very high position and uh, image and you know uh, status in society. Now, I agree, till such time as we make a pool of such people, you know, 10, 12, 15, we will still have to rely on retired judges. So, the answer is, you have the same structure as the 10th schedule, put it outside of the Speaker's office and have a top retired judge who impeccable credentials or a top statesman-like independent persona making the adjudication. That will inspire confidence. And no Speaker. Okay, so, so you are essentially saying that the anti-defection law doesn't need to be changed. It's the one who is implementing it and if that person does an honest job, then it will work out. Because so far we've seen it's not stopped anybody from switching not sides. Implementing. Anybody from the horse person? trading. Yes. No, the judge, the, the, the judgment today is not critical of the anti-defection law. Correct. It is critical of the way it is operated by the chief adjudicator. Yes. Who by nature, I won't even blame the speaker. Every speaker owes his allegiance to a party which put him there. And it is very difficult, it is unreal, it is uh, divine, it is uh, uh, daydreaming and night dreaming to imagine that speakers will be independent of the party which has put them there. So I think the real crux of the judgment is focusing on that. For which reason you will need to have outstanding judges, retired judges, and need not be limited to retired Supreme Court and High Court Chief Justice as the judgment says, or outstanding statesmen. But statesmen have a problem because they may not be trained judicially. This requires judicial qualities and talents. So at the end of the day, it will boil down and we have enough outstanding retired judges to fill the bill. Okay, my last question to you, Mr. Singh. We, again, I come back to the point that the, the Supreme Court says, and rightly so perhaps, that it's up to the parliament to relook at the powers of the speaker. Do political parties today want to relook at the powers of the speaker? Doesn't it work in their benefit you know, to have a speaker who may be on their side? Two or three answers to an important question by you. First of all, the judgment rightly does not legislate. It should not, cannot, and does not. Correct. 
Secondly, the sad answer to your question is, I don't think there is political will, to be honest. But there is one silver lining. The abuse of speaker's powers on the 10th schedule does have a opposing party and the ruling party in almost every case, be it central or mostly as it happens in state governments. So the ruling party will have the edge because the speaker is from theirs and the opposition will be at disadvantage. So there will be across the country a paradigm of at least, you know, a large number of parties not in power who should go for this solution. Now, the problem is that some of these parties not in power expect to be in power tomorrow. Mm. And when they are in power, the whole perspective changes. So I think this honest and sad answer to your question is no, most parties are not ready, but we have to build up a culture. And there are enough suffering political parties also who are out of power, who find biased speakers running rampage. So it's jolly well good time for those parties to think that, look, let's get this reform, even though uh, the reform may work against us in the future when we come back to power. Yes, well, at some point they all did decide to agree and bring about an anti-defection law. Maybe, like you said, I'm going to clutch onto that silver lining, uh, that if we keep talking about it and we bring about a larger conversation, at some point this change also happens. The Supreme Court has made its view very, very clear. Abhishek Manu Singh, we thank you so much for joining us and you know sharing your view on this very important uh, uh, you know set of words and the order that has come from the Supreme Court. Viewers, we've repeatedly discussed this. We've repeatedly put the spotlight on the roles of a uh, role of speaker of various assemblies, even the role of governors. And perhaps it is time for the parliament to look at this. You cannot have somebody who may have biases, who has current functional political allegiances, and you cannot expect that person to actually act in an unbiased manner when the question at hand could be formation of a government or a continuity for a government in a state. Imagine what's at risk here. Sarkar giregi ya rahegi jab aise decisions lene ho and when it comes to actually disqualifying MLS, it's a very big responsibility. Can we really expect a speaker to act in an unbiased manner as he should? Otherwise, we'll keep ending up at the Supreme Court. We'll keep going back to courts every time there is a fight about this. So perhaps it is time for the parliament to look at this issue and come up with an independent authority who can then take these decisions. Thank you so much for joining us on this conversation. Tamil superstar Rajini Khan refuses to apologize to protesters who are up in arms over his controversial remark on social reformer E.V. Ramasamy Periyar. Rajini Khan came out of his residence with copies of news publications and said, well, I was quoting this and so I'm not going to apologize. His comment comes days after a Dravidian outfit demanded an apology from him for the remarks he made on a rally taken out by social reformer Periyar decades ago. Rajni had said in a rally led by Periyar in 1971 that idols of deities were without clothes. The Dravidian outfit has accused Rajni Kant of uttering a blatant lie. So, I Sorry, <laughs> Pramod Madhav joins us with more on this story. Pramod, Rajni Karanth is not taking a step back. He's not even saying, maybe I was wrong, I was simply quoting. He says, I won't apologize. Was there a larger political motive here to the remarks he made about Periyar? Well, we can definitely say that Rajinikanth knew what he was doing because he was talking in a, a magazine's event and that magazine 
uh, is of a, like you know carries extremely right views, and that's the reason he was very specific about whatever he said. And very inter- interestingly, he quoted three incidents of which this has become a very big issue because uh, uh, not just uh, uh, Periyar, uh, he was also trying to say the uh, event occurred at Salem on 1971. The bigger problem right now is that uh, confirming that event and what exactly happened did it occur the way Rajinikanth had said so. That is a, like you know, it's very becoming very difficult to confirm. In fact, today what Rajinikanth presented as an evidence itself was nothing but an article that was released. I mean, uh, like uh, uh, aired on 2017, not 1971, but 2017. And whatever Rajinikanth had said, that was just a uh, like you know, a, a part of the article, maybe three lines. So that's the reason more uh, uh, like uh, the Dravidian party members are questioning as to how can Rajinikanth say something without uh, bringing proof when the allegations of this big order. All right, Pramod, thanks so much for joining us uh, on this story. There's obviously become a huge debate and a huge controversy.